right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to our May webinar, the fifth of the 2023 series. I'm really happy to welcome everyone and welcome Dr. Nathaniel Day, who will be speaking about Alberta's virtual opioid dependency program. I'd like to start with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the lands on which we're hosting this meeting include the traditional territories of many nations. The work of Medify and our partners takes place on traditional territories of the Indigenous nations who have lived on these lands since time immemorial. Medify is located in Toronto on the ancestral homelands of the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabeg, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, and the Atawenderons. This is dish with one spoon treaty territory. Medify is committed to reconciliation. We recognize that the many injustices experienced by the Indigenous peoples of what we now call Canada continue to affect their health and well being. We respect and embrace the rich cultural and traditional practices of the ancestors. We invite our partners to reflect on the territories where they are situated and to join us in committing to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship, and contributing to reconciliation. Uh, many of you have joined us throughout this uh, webinar series. Um, I think really for the purposes of accreditation, I need to just restate that this is an opportunity to help support uh, our learning and implementation of interdisciplinary, integrated and innovative models of care, that we support uh, initiatives that strengthen access to equitable and high quality care. And through this series um, that we really strive to develop our community of practice. Um, so today's session uh, about Alberta's virtual uh, ODP presented by Dr. Nathaniel Day will help us to understand outcomes from Alberta's virtual only approach to opioid treatment, opioid addiction treatment, uh, understand and explore how virtual care in Alberta engages vulnerable populations and bridges gaps in care. Um, and I'm really interested in learning about uh, Alberta's and, and Dr. Day's experience uh, in terms of engagement with regulatory bodies. Um, and decision making. Dr. Nathaniel Day is an addiction medicine specialist certified through the American Board of Addiction Medicine. He is the medical director, addiction in Alberta Health Services, provincial addiction and mental health and corrections health services portfolio. Dr. Day developed and implemented Alberta's virtual opioid dependency program, was a member of the Alberta Minister's Opioid Emergency Response Commission, and is the current co chair of Alberta's. Re Recovery Expert Advisory Panel. Under Dr. Day's leadership, the Virtual Opioid Dependency Program has been recognized as a leading practice by the Health Standards Organization, the Health Quality Council of Alberta, the Western Canadian Addiction Forum, and Dr. Day was recently awarded a Queen Elizabeth II Platinum Jubilee Medal in recognition of his efforts to provide addiction treatment on demand across Alberta. That is a very impressive resume. Uh, just a reminder to please share your comments and questions during the webinar by posting in the chat box and make sure that you select everyone, not just hosts and panelists. Uh, I will be um, sort of collating questions. We usually have about half an hour or so um, at the end to make sure that we have lots of um, opportunity to share questions. Um, and I'm really not sure how the hand raising works in terms of being able to um, unmute, but I think Lori can do that. So usually we post comments and chats uh, in the box and I'll share them, but if we can figure out how to make that work so people can post their own questions, that will be great. Uh, please complete the session evaluation at the end of the webinar. Uh, our June webinar will be um, looking at um, substance use among people um, who are trafficked. And a thank you to our webinar committee meeting committee members. And we will be um, done what I'm sure is gonna be a great webinar in time for everyone to be watching their respective playoff games. And sorry, I just wanna not forget to say happy National Nursing Week to our many colleagues who contribute to, um, to the teams that make all of this work possible. Thank you and welcome Dr. Gay. Thanks so much for the uh, 
invitation to present today and for the the kind welcome. I appreciate it, and I'm you know really honored to be able to uh, spend some time with you this uh, this evening. And I I hope that the presentation today is uh, interesting and worthwhile, and look forward to the uh, discussion that will come after. I'm just going to share my slides here. Hopefully that's come up uh, well. Looks like it's working on my end. Uh, so uh, as mentioned, I'm Nathaniel Day. I'm the medical director for addictions with Provincial Addiction and Mental Health Team. And is everyone still there? I just got a crash notification for oh, Zoom. We can so, hear. We can hear you and see and see the slide. Slides. Yeah, well, that, okay. that's great. Zoom must have crashed and restarted without us even noticing. <laughs> You're, good. You're good. All right, perfect. Um, all right, perfect. So in terms of disclosures, um, the Virtual Opioid Dependency Program receives grant funding from Alberta Health, uh, the government of Alberta through Alberta Health Services, and uh, I have no other commercial interests to disclose. In, in the way of background, I mean, we're Canadians and we're working in the addiction space, so I don't think we need to have a huge amount of background. But I will point out that uh, in Western Canada, we have just a terrible toxic drug supply. And so this, actually, this slide actually is looking at British Columbia and Alberta. Um, in British Columbia, they've got this beautiful grouped data that shows that 85.8% of decedents uh, had fentanyl and analogs in their systems when they died. 44% had cocaine, 40, uh, almost 42% had meth, uh, methamphetamine, 22% other opioids, 25% ethyl alcohol and benzodiazepines and so, so on. Um, we don't have that grouped data. So for the purposes of this slide, I put together our 2019 and our 2022. We also have the 2020, 2021 data as well, but it would be too cluttered. Really, the point of this is to just show that in Western Canada, we're dealing with a tremendous amount of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs in our drug supply. Uh, in Alberta, very similar to British Columbia. Um, if not, perhaps a little bit more uh, fentanyl and carfentanyl in our supply. Um, you'll note in 2022, for example, uh, at the time I pulled this data, 93% uh, of our decedents had fentanyl and 32% had carfentanyl. We tend to have a little bit more methamphetamine and less cocaine, um, but we also tend to have a lot less other opioids. Uh, so some things to think about as well, uh, by by way of background is that um, our overdose fatality rate in 2022 was a 33 uh, people per 100,000 population, um, which is about 10 uh, per 100,000 less than the rate in British Columbia. We've had a reduction in overdose deaths in 2022 compared to 2021. Uh, I think that uh, when I last looked at it, I think it was in the order of about a 12% reduction from the year before. However, the rates still are very high and uh, certainly much higher than they were before the pandemic. Um, overdose in Alberta uh, is a multi-drug issue. Uh, so we uh, certainly see, as, as was shown in the previous slide, a lot of methamphetamine, cocaine, and alcohol. Um, and that deaths are occurring in a three to one ratio of males to females, predominantly in people who are in private residence and, uh, residences and working aged. Um, in Alberta, access to this uh, data is widely available. So there's a health analytics reporting site, which is updated regularly and provides uh, breakdowns for community and uh, overdose and OAT prescribing and all kinds of things. It's quite interesting. And then the, the last thing to think about, um, for me anyway, is that, you know, when we started the virtual opioid dependency program uh, just uh, six years ago, uh, it was very common for people to report using heroin or oxycodone. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, in the old days, I remember, you know, if we got a drug screen back that showed carfentanil, that caused a great deal of alarm. And we would, you know, phone our client and say, hey, look, you know, your supply has carfentanil in it. You need to be really careful. Uh, where today people report seeking uh, fentanyl 
uh, which is ubiquitous, ubiquitously called heroin in our jurisdiction and carfentanil. So it's very common actually to have people who uh, come in saying that they seek carfentanil as their drug of choice and seek fentanyl as their drug of choice. And it's actually, in my experience now, quite rare to have someone who's reporting using oxycodone. Um, and so, you know, in, in the opioid treatment side of things, um, the idea of someone accidentally ingesting fentanyl or carfentanil um, is uncommon in, in our patient population, although that doesn't speak to people who are using other substances and may be exposed to fentanyl. Uh, so I really appreciate this uh, study. So this is from JAMA Psychiatry, just came out a couple of years ago now. It's a large review of 15 RCTs and 36 uh, cohort studies that covered almost 750,000 patients. And what they found is that people who are treated with opioid agonist therapy have their all-cause mortality reduced by over 50%. And that reduction is regardless of gender, age, geographic location, HIV or hepatitis C status, previous IV drug use, and so on. And so we know that OAT works. And uh, the, the big challenge uh, per the authors in, in JAMA Psychiatry is that while we have an excellent treatment that, that actually works at reducing deaths from all causes, the real struggle is that access to this treatment remains limited and coverage for opioid agonist therapy remains low. And uh, their view is that, you know, work to improve access could have uh, important global population level benefits. And uh, certainly, you know, we saw this in Alberta. We had on one side of the river a treatment that actually works. And on the other side of the river, a host of people who really desperately wanted and need the treatment, but struggled to, to get access to it. So I'll always remember, uh, you know, a sentinel patient for me in my, in my clinical work. Uh, she was a young uh, Indigenous woman uh, who was addicted to fentanyl in the community. And uh, she was, uh, she discovered that she was pregnant. And, uh, and so she uh, decided that she needed to uh, stop using and that she needed to get ready to be a mother. And so she went to, she was living in an urban, one of our, our larger urban centers in Alberta. And she went to a local methadone program, was started on methadone and stabilized and did really, really well. And in fact, so well that she was able to uh, at delivery, she was able to take baby home with her, uh, which, you know, I think all of us would agree was a, it just a tremendous success uh, that uh, that she was able to to stabilize and be healthy, receive evidence based treatment and uh, and pursue that uh, mothering role. Uh, unfortunately, though, uh, she found that being a young single mom in a city far from her community of origin, uh, in early sustained recovery was challenging. And she made a very reasonable decision to leave uh, the city and move back to her rural uh, community uh, in order to get family support. Now, the problem was that her methadone provider in the city cut her off of methadone because she wasn't able to attend their pharmacy and she wasn't able to attend uh, regular visits. And she white knuckled it for a while. And so uh, she suffered through withdrawal and she went for several weeks without using, but eventually she had a slip and she was being monitored by our children's services uh, department. And when they found that she had relapsed, um, they apprehended baby. And so I was seeing her actually um, on one of our acute psychiatry units uh, at the psychiatric hospital I work at. And uh, I was seeing her there for a suicide attempt. And uh, so she, she had survived the suicide attempt. And as I listened to her story, I recognized that the reality is that our system wasn't designed to meet her needs. Um, it wasn't designed for her. And uh, really a huge part of the challenge that uh, she faced was that um, while our system and all of our healthcare systems are in the top 1% of funded healthcare systems in the entire world, um, there hadn't been enough thought put to, together to how to, on how to support a person like her. And so that was part of the thinking around setting up our virtual opioid dependency program. 
And we saw lots and lots of other barriers. So whether it was a person who was in corrections and who was released on a Friday afternoon of a long weekend, whose file at a local opioid dependency treatment program was closed, or whether it was somebody who uh, was uh, just new to the province uh, looking for work or uh, a person who had had an overdose in the emergency department and the emergency doctor knew, you know, had received training on how to start buprenorphine but wasn't uh, willing to start the person on buprenorphine because they had nowhere to refer that person after their overdose and after their stay in the emergency department. Just all kinds of barriers preventing people from getting the care that they needed. Uh, for that matter, in Alberta, we have a very uh, you know, heavy resource sector. Uh, people who uh, were hoping to return to work, wanting to go back to work, but needing to drop everything to run in to provide a urine a toxicology test or to run in to uh, provide a, a, a visit with a provider. We're, we're preventing them from going back to work. And we know that uh, work is one of the um, uh, biggest positive factors that can help a person uh, achieve uh, meaningful change in their lives and uh, move past the addiction challenges that they've been facing. There's all, just all kinds of barriers uh, that just really you know, weren't good enough. And so when, when we think about our systems, there are all kinds of things that stop us or were, were stopping us from, from doing the right thing for patients. And so I like to think of these as the stop signs. And so whether it's rural access or we're work, working remotely or just out of corrections or, um, you know, a resistance to starting a person on treatment as an inpatient in a hospital because of discharge planning, uh, police and correctional needs, uh, transitions in community and so on, just all kinds of uh, uh, things that were stopping people from getting the care that they needed when they needed it. And so we we had a, we, our thinking was that if, if we could design the system, if we could take a step back from what we're doing and how we're doing it, and actually look at what the patient journey looked like and figure out how to meet people where they were at and close gaps that were preventing them from receiving this evidence-based care, that you know we could we could figure out a better way, and so with the virtual opioid dependency program, uh, we have created a system where every Alberta resident uh, with opioid use uh, disorder has the opportunity to access some of our green lights, some of the green lights to get rid of those stop signs. So we have our our virtual opioid dependency program ongoing care team, and so that's a a multidisciplinary team that has social workers and addiction counselors and uh, registered psychiatric nurses and physicians uh, where we can provide ongoing care for a person in any community in our province, uh, rural and remote uh, to semi-urban, uh, as well as in urban areas, uh, but uh, usually for people who have struggle, who, who struggle to access face-to-face uh, -face programs. We also have uh, our VODP same day start team. And uh, you know this actually was uh, born out of patient experience as well. Uh, so uh, as, um, uh, as a, a patient scenario, uh, we had a, uh, a young woman who was referred to our program where the addiction counselor uh, sent in a referral and then actually phoned the program because she was so concerned about her overdose risk. And our program, of course, took that very seriously and we worked at getting a hold of her. And in those days, we didn't have Zoom and so we were, uh, and we didn't have our same day start uh, system. So um, we called her and we were working at uh, connecting with her so we could book her in for a telehealth, which usually took three to four days to, to get arranged. In any case, we, we never did end up reaching her. And uh, we found out after the fact that part of why we couldn't reach her was that uh, she'd actually already died of an overdose. And so our team looked at that and said, okay, you know what, we, we've got a problem. If Even if we'd have connected with her immediately, she would have already been dead before that, you know, the fastest telehealth we could arrange uh, is. And so we've got to figure out a way of doing it differently and uh, ideally same day. And so we've worked with our College of Physicians and Surgeons, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, but to develop a, a process that meets their requirements, but allows us to actually connect with patients the very same day that they need it and ask for care. And uh, today I'm pleased to report that the median wait time for a patient in Alberta to receive care through our, through our program in Alberta Health Services is zero days. 
And we also have developed our VODP transitions team, which really works to support people who are uh, moving between care providers in any setting. So whether it's getting out of the uh, correction system or new to the province or a person who's just been released from hospital or was just seen in the emergency department. Uh, we like to say to our emergency doctors uh, who are you know, now pres prescribing Suboxone uh, post overdose uh, that if they send the referral to us, we will reach out to that person and connect with them before the next dose is due, where we can uh, check in on how they're doing and adjust the dose as needed. We also have our low barrier service, recognizing that there's, uh, there's a whole uh, population of patients who really struggle to jump through the hoops. And instead of booking them an appointment next Tuesday at three o'clock, uh, if we actually just meet them where they're at and you know when they call in from a pharmacy, that's the time of their appointment and uh, we do the check-in uh, things that we need to and uh, work with other team members uh, in, including you know shelter workers or supervised consumption site uh, staff that uh, we can uh, we can provide uh, low barrier service and uh, and and meet people there and, and and then one of the exciting things that we're uh, we've just started to do in pilot phase is our new children and youth service and so we've applied these uh, sort of green lights all over the place, trying to resolve the uh, previous barriers that were stopping people from getting the care they needed. Uh, so this is the, uh, the front page of our website. Uh, how can we help? And, uh, and I, I think that that will likely resonate with everybody. We're all trying to figure out ways that we can help people who are in these desperate circumstances. <laughs> Alberta's virtual opioid dependency program. My name is Kareem. How may I help you? Hi there. I'd like to start treatment to get started right away. There are no fees or wait lists required. Great. I've been thinking of starting treatment for a while. Let's get the consultation started. Um, so, taking that step back, what's Alberta's Virtual Opioid Dependency Program? Um, we're a treatment uh, program that provides same-day assessment and treatment. Um, our median wait time is zero days, and um, we like to say we can provide treatment on demand. Uh, any Alberta resident can receive ongoing care through uh, the Virtual Opioid Dependency Program, but we're also not hoarding patients. So we're not trying to do all opioid dependency treatment work in Alberta. We do a ton of transitional uh, care where uh, we'll start a person on treatment, stabilize them, and then transition their care to their the provider of their choice, be that their primary care provider or a local uh, opioid dependency treatment program uh, or you know, RAM clinic or, or other place. Um, in Alberta now, any emergency doctor can start Suboxone or Methadone and hand off care with no delay. We actually worked with our emergency strategic uh, clinical network in Alberta to ensure that every emergency department had uh, training on how to safely start uh, buprenorphine. And then anyone changing care settings uh, can receive same day help to ensure that their care is not interrupted. And that includes actually, it's very common for someone, for example, who's missed some doses, their own clinic is closed, they're desperate for help and don't want to relapse. And our, our team uh, will uh, help them out and, and get them a prescription and then uh, provide uh, that information back to their usual provider and will bridge their care until they can uh, reconnect back for a face-to-face -face appointment with their own care team. Uh, and then because we've developed this uh, virtual platform that we work out of, we're finding that uh, there are new places where traditionally people have not been able to get care that we can reach. And so this includes our low barrier team, uh, people who are receiving care at supervised consumption sites or overdose prevention sites, shelter spaces, and uh, one of the, the big sort of new initiatives uh, that we worked on last year was uh, providing care in police holding cells. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, you can call or are referred uh, with our toll-free number. It's available anywhere in Alberta. And a professional staff will take your call and immediately start assessment. And then we've got addiction medicine consultants who will review that intake assessment from our staff. We also have a few other uh, 
you know, really beneficial uh, things in Alberta. So we have something called Connect Care, which is Epic software um, that's connecting all of our healthcare sites. We have Net Care, which has our pharmacy information site and lab work. Uh, Assist, which is our provincial, our, before we had Connect Care, our provincial addiction and mental health database, where we can actually see what's gone on for this person in the past. And then uh, the addiction medicine consultant will connect virtually with the patient, usually within minutes. And uh, we'll work with that person to create a care plan. A prescription is then sent to a local pharmacy of the person's choice. A pharmacist will then review the initiation plan with the person in person and provide the medication to that uh, individual. And then our staff will reconnect with that person the next day to see how the, how the induction went, how they're feeling and make adjustments from there. And then most importantly, work on the care plans for the next steps uh, in that person's care. In terms of uh, results, we're pleased to report that we're seeing positive results. So uh, if you're familiar with the brief treatment outcome measure, BTOM, um, you'll know that uh, a lower score in the BTOM denotes improved social functioning. And so this is things like employment, participation in school, family relationships, time spent with uh, people who are not using substances versus uh, people who are using substances, trouble with money, things like that. And so we uh, see a steady improvement in people's social functioning as they stay with the program. We also see a, a major decline in overdose over time and our program's very busy with our same day starts. We are now uh, seeing well over a thousand new intakes uh, per quarter. And so this data now is starting to look a little bit long in the tooth as we've had uh, you know, very significant growth over the last several years. Um, in terms of drug use, uh, in the bottom left-hand corner of this slide, uh, you'll see that uh, people are reporting on intakes about 65% using fentanyl, uh, which drops to about 7% at three months and continues to drop as our assessments go through to six and 12 months. Uh, you may be curious of why it's so low, just 65% reporting fentanyl use. Um, part of that is that a person who is admitted uh, to us, say, post a correction stay or after uh, inpatient treatment or out of a hospitalization may not have had any use in the days before they called us. So uh, they may actually have no drug use reported. Um, and that's, uh, you know, those numbers are reflect uh, sort of current drug use. A couple of uh, patient comments from our reviews. I've gained trust with this program. It doesn't feel like I'm being punished. Another uh, patient said being able to work all over the province and still being able to get my medication was one of the big benefits that they saw with their care. And uh, something that has been uh, really great to see because we know employment has such a meaningful impact for people that 56% of clients, so we, we do a, a snapshot where I think uh, each year we pull about a hundred of our patients. Um, and so of, of the patients who've reported, and we do that every year, but uh, uh, of patients who reported a change in job status, 56% uh, were reporting um, new income related to employment. Uh, so something that's uh, worth, I think, thinking about, uh, we actually started our treatment program at the same time as a brand new rural face-to-face -face program that was set up. We actually had the same initiation budget and uh, we were started at the same time. We were able to see patients faster because uh, we didn't have to set up a, a bricks and mortar clinic. Um, and so you'll see that our, our patient count started to grow more quickly. But by having a virtual access with no in in-person component. So patients never have to come to a clinic. They don't ever have to walk through the doors of a healthcare center um, is very appealing and uh, people vote with their feet. And so you'll see that um, we've, we've just grown very rapidly. And I think the other thing thinking about barriers is that if we put a new bricks and mortar clinic in a, in a rural setting, even if you are only 15 minutes away from that rural setting, if you don't have a vehicle that's reliable for you that is just as inaccessible as if you were an hour away or two hours away. Uh, because uh, particularly in rural areas where there's not, uh, you know, adequate public transit or other options um, that really there, even though we're trying to eliminate barriers, we're not always successful in, in eliminating barriers if we do things in a traditional way. Uh, I'll also point out for the 2022 numbers that these were the best numbers I had at the time I made the slides and they only go to September. So we were already well over our previous uh, 
uh, numbers for 2021 in the first nine months of the year. We're uh, well over 5,000 people uh, that we served last year. Alberta's virtual opioid dependency program. My name's Kareen. How may I help you? Hi there. I would really like to start treatment today. Okay, we can get started right away. There are no fees or wait lists required. Great. I've been thinking of starting treatment for a while. Let's get the consultation started. Um, I really love that commercial. So every time it, I feel emotional when I see that, because I, I, I can still in my mind, I can close my eyes and still be in that consultation room for that young woman who had attempted suicide because she'd lost everything that mattered to her um, when she was just trying to do the right thing for herself and her daughter. Um, and so anyway, I just, I love that commercial. And um, these commercials actually have run on all of the major networks in Alberta. Um, helping the public to be aware that there are options. And, uh, and uh, anyway, I, uh, I'm really grateful that today in Alberta, in any community, you know, any person who is facing a similar circumstance to that would not, our, our system has changed, uh, that, that person would get same day access to care. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about partnership building. Uh, so we have to recognize, so CPSA is our College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta, and we have to recognize that they have a real and important mandate to protect the public. And that includes protecting the public from uh, medical care that's not adequate. And so as we were looking at how to develop a virtual only model of care, we worked really closely with them to walk through some of the things that we were planning to do and uh, sought actively sought their advice on how to do it in a way that uh, would meet the regulations that we have and that would allow them comfort. We also had the benefit that we're within Alberta Health Services, which is our provincial health care system. Uh, we don't uh, have sort of regional uh, health care systems. It's the, the sort of full province wide health care system. And because of that, they knew that, you know, we weren't a, a fly by night organization or trying to set up a pill mill or something like that. But then on top of that, we were able to show them our uh, evidence evaluation plan and uh, all the work that we were prepared to do in order to show whether or not these interventions were actually helping protect the public and that we were actually able to help the college protect the public by providing access to evidence based care. And in developing that relationship, and I've sent to the college our quarterly reports and annual reports showing the actual evidence and the actual data of what we're seeing, it's allowed them to know that um, we are helping them in their mandate. And so that's allowed them some comfort in giving us permission to do some things differently. Like, for example, the same day start service pre pandemic, we were asking them for the opportunity to start people on on suboxone on buprenorphine naloxone without a video call and without uh, laying eyes on the person just a telephone assessment. And so we walked through with them what things we would be doing to assess how we would check the collateral information and what we could do to protect the public, recognizing that fentanyl use was in our minds an emergency. And in doing that and giving them the evidence, they were able to uh, allow us to be nuanced in how we were interpreting interpreting the regulations and still on side with them and that was a critical thing so for any jurisdiction where people are looking at doing sort of novel things i really strongly recommend and encourage uh open collaboration with the regulator in order to make sure that you don't end up uh, running into roadblocks on top of that, we also have had lots of partnerships uh, within Alberta Health Services with detox sites and hospitals, emergency departments, and those uh, opportunities have been invaluable for us to learn about what their struggles are so that we could adapt to what the needs actually are on the ground. And then we've had open collaboration with our government in order to help government understand uh, the the evidence of what we're doing and the uh, clinical picture that we're seeing uh, in order to uh, move policy and also receive the support that we need as we've had very rapid growth. This has allowed us to do work that I didn't think uh, just a few years ago would ever be possible. So for example, um, I'm sure it's the same in Ontario, uh, but in our police cells, the police, if they arrested you, would have the right to hold you for up to 24 hours. And in holding you, uh, they 
continue to do their you know investigation stuff but you will eventually see a justice of the peace who's going to decide if you go on bail or if you go uh if you get released uh or pardon me if you go to the remand center and uh and in that time if you didn't use the moment before you were arrested you're going to go into withdrawal and so we know that there are people who are just suffering in withdrawal uh in cells which presents significant challenges uh, to everybody, to the client, of course, obviously, to police who have an obligation to care for the medical needs of a person in their care. And then as well for the justices who are looking at this person who's in agony in front of them and trying to make a determination of whether they're safe to release. Um, so what we did is we uh, created a system because we have this virtual setup in place where we use the same phone booths that a person would use to speak with their lawyer so it's completely confidential, has nothing to do with the police investigation, and there's no communication between us and the police officers. But we we're actually able to do a healthcare intervention and assess that person and see where they're at, what they've been using, and we actually will send to pharmacies prescriptions to get started on treatment with delivery to the uh, to the cell block. And the person can get initiated on treatment. If they continue in corrections, then they can stay on treatment in the correction system. If they're released, they've had an opportunity to see that treatment can actually work for them, and they can follow up with us in, in community if they choose and re receive ongoing care. Uh, something we're really excited about is, uh, though it's in the early stages, we did ad an administrative data poll where we looked at, uh, I think, just under 700 individuals who'd had a police start. And uh, we looked at whether or not they were receiving a prescription in the community 90 days later. And 90 days later, just under 10% of those folks were continuing with treatment, which is just very exciting, especially recognizing that none of them went to cells that day looking for care. We also, uh, because of the relationships we've built with our College of Physicians and Surgeons and others, we uh, were given the opportunity to work with our Edmonton Remand Centre. It's the largest jail in Canada. Uh, it has space for up to 2,000 people, typically has about 1,600 people who are there. And it has a very short length of stay. So if I recall correctly, uh, the average length of stay is less than a week. And that, that resulted in some real logistical challenges. So uh, I'll just explain it. If a, if a person was admitted before we became involved, uh, they were admitted to the remand center, um, they would get a nursing assessment, they'd go to the cell block. And then if you set up an OAT clinic for that person, you know, for several days later, or even the next day, if there was, you know, an issue on the cell block that they might be on lockdown and nobody can go and the OAT clinic would get canceled. Um, or if there aren't enough guards who are on that day to bring a person down to the assessment room, then they would miss their appointment and have to be rebooked. And we can all appreciate that having a person in for an average length of stay but for about a week and not starting them on OAT is going to result in them with having terrible withdrawal, being primed for a relapse to use, and uh, actually uh, queuing them up for an overdose because of loss of tolerance. So we actually were able to develop uh, our asynchronous telehealth project in Remand, where basically every inmate now is screened for OUD and we actually do uh, a video recorded assessment. So that's the asynchronous part, uh, 24 hours a day. And so it's very common for our team to wake up in the morning and there's a few assessments that are sitting in the queue waiting to be done. And we'll actually do that. Uh, and, and we turn around and are able to get those people started on treatment within 24 hours of arrival. Uh, that's now allowing people to, to receive compassionate and appropriate care. And it's also helping for return to community. Now I'm going to talk uh, very briefly and I'm almost done because we want to have some conversation and I recognize I've been you know, going on and on. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about speed bumps. Um, we believe that we should be trying to direct the traffic and trying to slow down the traffic uh, in areas where uh, an option is more risky and encourage the flow of traffic uh, into areas that are, that are less risky. So because we have a virtual only model, we prefer using buprenorphine, but we also use methadone and we also use Cadian. And we also don't want to put up unnecessary barriers. But the, the reason I have the speed bump there is that the easiest thing to get started on if you were to call in our toll-free number is buprenorphine. If you want, and, and we can do that over the phone. 
But if you say to me on the phone, no, I'd, I'd way rather be on methadone. I, I heard methadone's better. My friend's on it. That's no problem. I'll start you on methadone today. But in order to do the methadone, I actually need to see you. And so we actually just insist on having a Zoom call with that person. And so they're going to need to download Zoom onto their phone. Uh, or uh, if they don't have a phone, a smartphone, they can go into the pharmacy. And most pharmacies we work with will allow the person to use a video there or whatever. But we'll get a video. And for most people, that means a five minute delay. And that five minute delay is enough that many people, that little speed bump will, uh, I don't know how many times I've had somebody where they are saying, I really want methadone. I say, yeah, no problem. We just need to do a video. And they say, I forget it. I'll try Suboxone. And, uh, and this actually leads, having these deliberate little speed bumps and ways of, of trying to direct traffic actually is having a system level effect. So first of all, in Alberta, between 80 and 90% of all OAT starts in the public health care system are now happening through our same day start service uh, with, the v with VODP. Um, because of the speed bumps, we're, we're seeing a push into Suboxone over Methadone. And then as well, uh, our Alberta gap coverage medication program uh, pays for anyone in Alberta uh, to get methadone, suboxone, or sublocade, uh, it, but it doesn't pay for cadian and it doesn't pay for hydromorphone. And so that also helps push people into the most evidence-based options. And, uh, and I've already mentioned the police cell stuff. So this is actually a comparison. I'm going to compare British Columbia, that's this slide, to Alberta, and then we're basically done. Um, in British Columbia today, about 57% of people receiving OAT are on methadone, 26% are on buprenorphine products, and then almost 20% of people are on morphine or hydromorphone. Uh, in Alberta, 66% of patients are on buprenorphine, only 33% are on methadone, and about 1% are on hydromorphone. And so, um, if you think about that, that's a huge difference. Um, and in, in fact, in Alberta, it used to be very similar. In uh, just a few years ago, Alberta used to be about 80% methadone and 20% buprenorphine. Um, and then uh, here I'm into my last slide. Um, Alberta's building a recovery oriented system of care. I was in a press conference recently where uh, a reporter was asking our Minister of Health, uh, why are you talking about recovery so much? Recovery is so controversial. And I was speaking with uh, Keith Humphreys, uh, who's the chair of the Stanford Lancet Commission on the North American Opioid Crisis. And Keith, Keith said to me something brilliant. He said, recovery is not controversial. If you took a thousand families with someone in addiction, a thousand families would want recovery for their loved one. What's controversial is when people aren't willing to do things to help a person where recovery is not in the cards at that time. So of course we want to provide naloxone, of course we want to have supervised consumption sites, of course we want to uh, have clean supplies so that people aren't uh, transmitting HIV and hepatitis. There are all kinds of things that we need to do to help people, but recovery itself is not controversial. A recovery oriented system requires coordination, adaptable services, and a, and a, a dedicated focus on what's actually happening for the patients so that we can make sure that we meet their needs. And addiction medicine has a profound role to play in guiding system improvement. And that's it. That's what I've got uh, for you today. I'm looking forward to whatever questions come up. Um, wow, I have so many questions of my own. I'm expecting that uh, we'll have lots coming up in the chat and um, we may try to let people ask their own questions if that can work. Um, Katie is asking, and I, I guess this is a great starting point, um, more about any lessons learned in providing virtual care. And that ties into a lot of my questions, like to never see someone, um, you know, that that visual assessment in terms of buprenorphine and withdrawal or sedation and methadone, you never do a urine screen for starting someone, like this is all just based on self-report and I guess what collateral data you can access. Like, Tell me a bit more about those things, please. Yeah, for sure. So that these were some of the same concerns we had. How do we do this safely when we started, which actually led us to our quite robust data evaluation because we all we all knew that if it wasn't working and it wasn't safe, this is something we would abandon. Um, and and so we've been really reassured 
that the data looks good. And so we're not seeing, you know, terrible outcomes from that. Something though that we we had to to kind of uh, I won't say kind of that we had to bear in mind is that the alternative as well was pretty dismal. So if we didn't meet that person and we didn't provide you know the best that we could in virtual care, their alternative was no care, and no care meant calling a dealer who had some weird mixture of fentanyl and other things to sell them. And so I think for us in healthcare, we have to kind of alter our perspective and say, look, the alternative isn't you face to face with me in my clinic. The alternative is you not receiving care at all. Now we also have the benefit, like when we first started, we were all telehealth based. And so we were seeing people, we were registering them in healthcare centers and that sort of thing. And, and that's how we were able to get past some of our own natural you know, healthcare provider concerns. And then we do have a robust data sharing system. So I can see the heart tracings that you've had in the past. I can see all of your toxicology screens that have been done in the public health system anywhere in Alberta ever in the past. I can access all of that data. And so I've got a lot of information in front of me. Um, and then we also do get drug screens and things like that uh, when we need to. Um, but we're inclined to start a person today and then worry about some of that stuff in the next, in the next day or two. So just because I don't want to belabor the urine drug screens, because that is a very small part of all the things that, um, you know, make up care, but um, how and when does that come into play and how do you direct people to get those screens? I, I hear you, not so relevant for people who want to start care, more relevant down the road, maybe for feedback or people who want to start getting take home doses. One of, one of the benefits of our provincialized healthcare system is that I can send a person for a, a toxicology screen to any healthcare center anywhere in the province. So all I have to do is fax a requisition and they can go to any lab that exists out there in the public system and it's free for them. Um, the other thing that we've done in rural and remote areas is we've actually partnered with the lab where the lab will train pharmacists and their staff to do collections for us. So if you're out in Timbuktu, uh, you can actually just do a, a urine toxicology screen uh, at, the, at the pharmacy in the bathroom and, uh, and we're okay with that. Like a point of care test. It won't get to the lab, but it'll at no, least... No, they'll, they'll collect it and they'll seal it and sign off and it gets shipped to the University of Calgary, which is where we get all of our labs done for confirmation and gas chromatography and all of that. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that par partnership with pharmacies and pharmacists? Because it sounds like that's a, a pretty critical piece as well. Absolutely. When we first started, so we weren't called the Virtual Opioid Dependency Program at all at first. The first phase of our rollout, we were called the Rural Opioid Dependency Program. And really the first phase was saying to all of those rural communities that had no access, you can have access. And so part of the challenge at first was that no rural pharmacies stocked uh, buprenorphine or methadone. Uh, but we worked with those pharmacies and help them really understand that the people we were sending to them, we weren't collecting 50 people from neighboring communities and uh, congregating them all at their pharmacy. Um, we actually were just treating the people that they already knew and were taking care of. And they just, those patients just weren't getting adequate evidence-based treatment. So these patients were already in their pharmacies, were already customers, they were people that they knew, and now they could actually get the care they, they needed. Today in Alberta, every rural pharmacy stocked methadone and, and uh, buprenorphine. And in fact, in Alberta, pharmacists are allowed to give injections. And so we work with uh, the manufacturer and many of our rural pharmacists also give the sublocade shot for us. It's interesting. There's a, a petition that was just posted to the Medify listserv today, I think, um, asking all pharmacies in Ontario to... Um, to stock and support buprenorphine, methadone, and cadian, um, because I think that it's like 40, it's barely 50% that do. So that's pretty remarkable. Well, as, as we worked with pharmacies and, and helped the pharmacy realize this was a person coming already, because we don't direct people to pharmacies, they can pick the pharmacy they go to already. Um, in my in all of the rollout, and we've provide, provided care in nearly 400 communities all across rural Alberta. Um, there was only ever one community where we didn't have a pharmacy that was willing to work with us. And it was, it was the only pharmacy in that little tiny town. 
and eventually they did come around and provided uh, provided care for for our patient. And um, it it actually it, we worried that that would be a major issue, and it didn't end up being a major issue. In a similar way, there was a lot of concern about the not in my backyard phenomenon about using our telehealth sites and you know all of that. But by distributing the care everywhere, there actually isn't a con a congregation of 50 people in a parking lot, you know, waiting for their turn in the methadone clinic. And it really distributes it everywhere. And we've had zero concerns that way. So that's a great, you know, sort of opportunity for me to ask about that um, access to care where people are calling or videoing from and where is your team? I assume that your providers are also distributed given that the work is virtual. Yeah, so we do have a, a home base. So um, I, you know, before we started this program, I was already working um, as the medical director at the Centennial Center for Mental Health and Brain Injury in Pinoca, which is uh, about an hour south of Edmonton. Um, and so we started the program there and we do have a home base there. Um, we've actually outgrown that. So uh, we have uh, you know, one satellite clinic already for staff, and then we do a lot of remote work as well. So um, I think people are wondering, you know, how many hours can you actually cover over seven days? You know, what, what do those look like? And um, as part of that, I'm wondering about who does the intake the initial intake and gathers that information to then pass on to um to the prescribers and what happens if and when that sort of virtual door is closed yeah so we we have staffing available to do intakes uh for 12 hours a day so eight in the morning until eight at night uh, i can tell you we don't love doing intakes at 7 55 uh, which is always a bit of a challenge but we recognize that people are in crisis Part of why we picked those hours is that they reflect most of the pharmacy hours in our area. Um, so it's only in downtown Edmonton and downtown Calgary really where you can get 24 hour pharmacies uh, available. Uh, we do have a, a telephone service through uh, actually the hospital where we originally started for people who, you know, if there's something urgent in the middle of the night where they can reach a prescriber. Um, but we do have a, a cadre of physicians now that do provide that care. In fact, our same day start team is so busy between the low barrier team and our, our same day start service that it's, you know, Monday to Friday, we actually have four physicians who are working that team at a time. Yeah. Um, are nurse practitioners part of the prescriber team in Alberta? Yeah, so there are nurse practitioners in our area are really hard to come by, so they're rare. We actually have our first uh, postings for nurse practitioners going up here shortly. And if there are any nurse practitioners in Ontario who are looking to come out to Alberta to do uh, opioid dependency care, uh, keep your eyes open for our posting. So someone, is it a person or a computer program that connects someone from their call to the first available staff and from there to the prescriber? Yeah, so it's an, it's an automated uh, call at first, uh, but the, the person who's calling in, you know, there's a menu of options like, you know, I want to speak with my own case manager because I'm receiving ongoing care already, or I need a same day start. Um, they that ends up going to a live person and the staff who run and it, you asked this before and I forgot to answer it, but the staff who actually do our intake assessments are staff who are trained in that intake assessment, but are typically addiction counselors, uh, social workers or nurses. And we use all three. Um, so I'm guessing that everyone is on some kind of salary to be doing this work paid by the Ministry of Health. How does that work? Yeah, so it's actually uh, in terms of obviously in terms of all our allied health staff, they're all salaried employees. Um, in Alberta, there's um, an alternative remuneration plan uh, for physicians. And actually, our fee schedule is uh, good enough that it actually is uh, better to be on fee for service for this work. And it's busy enough that uh, our physician group has elected to be fee for service. So when someone registers, their health card is entered into the system and, um, and then it just goes from there. That's right. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to, while I go 
ask a question and then go back through because I know that I've missed a lot of questions that people have posted. Um, you talked about um, the shift in the number of people on buprenorphine relative to methadone since this has been implemented. Um, you've got stop signs and green lights for go and then your speed bump. And at first I thought that your speed bump was referring to kind of a, you know, a, a problematic issue, but it sounds like you're suggesting that that speed bump in diverting more people to buprenorphine is a really um, positive outcome. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm wondering how that's translating into people staying on treatment, because certainly we hear a lot about buprenorphine not necessarily being uh, first choice treatment or adequate to meet the needs of people who have really high opioid tolerance. Yeah, so really appreciate that. And that's something whenever I'm at national meetings, that's something I always hear about. And, uh, you know, how do you get people to try buprenorphine? You know, nobody who takes fentanyl in our area wants to be on buprenorphine, that sort of thing. Um, what I can tell you about those that data, so the 66% of all patients receiving OAT in any, so that's, that's actually, that's not VODP data, that's our provincial prescribing data. And so in Alberta, for the whole province, 66% of all, all opio, opioid dependency treatment patients are on, on a buprenorphine product, whether it's sublocate or suboxone. And uh, that speaks to staying on treatment. Uh, because if they were only on buprenorphine for a week, then we would we would still see all of that prescribing. Uh, my experience is that uh, people who are on buprenorphine, like people are able to get very good effect from buprenorphine with fentanyl use and with carfentanyl use. And in fact, the people that I see struggle the most are the people who are, are given inadequate doses of methadone, inadequate doses of cadian to actually meet their their withdrawal needs. And because we know it takes so long to get the doses up for people, then we lose people to care there. In our program, you know, we used to do traditional uh, buprenorphine inductions. We don't do those anymore. We've really gone after um, the American model of rapid induction to high dose buprenorphine, the macro induction uh, sort of philosophy that uh, developed in the in American emergency departments. Uh, so it's very, uh, you know, the most common prescription that I would give for somebody who's coming in, uh, having been using uh, fentanyl and carfentanil and they're, you know, tw you know, 16, 20 hours since their last use and they're feeling pretty miserable, is to actually just give them 16 milligrams of buprenorphine, wait for 30 to 60 minutes. If they're not markedly improved, another 16 milligrams up to 32 milligrams that day. And it's astonishing how, you know, how quickly they'll feel much better. The second day is even better. And then when we see people where they're saying, yeah, that didn't, that didn't go great. I still feel really un uncomfortable. When we actually talk about what symptoms they're having, the most common thing, if, if we had our physician team here that they would talk about is actually benzo sounding withdrawal. And so what we'll often do is add a little bit of a benzo to that because we think that there's likely a little, a, a little bit or a component of benzodiazepine withdrawal. And that often solves the problem and the person's now feeling much better and we'll do a quick benzo taper for them while we continue the buprenorphine. But I, I see very good effect with buprenorphine and fentanyl. And like I was saying at the beginning, our fentanyl is the drug of choice in our community. That's all we treat. We, we don't treat other opioids really. And, uh, and we find that buprenorphine works very well. So how, how does reassessment happen after that day one? I could be totally on board with getting someone onto 32 milligrams of buprenorphine day one. I'm assuming you just go through the, um, you know, counseling about how and when to start. What's the follow-up? Yeah. So uh, we ask, ideally, we want them to call us the next day and let us know, but we'll chase them down too if we need to. Um, but we have our allied health team. We'll reach out to that person and check in and see how they're feeling and then uh, report back. And we have a, a regular team meeting for all new inductions that uh, we run and we'll review every single person and report on how they're doing. And then from there, we'll make a treatment decision and send a new prescription out for them. Uh, if there's any concerns or any issues that are atypical, then of course we'll get a prescriber on the horn with that person to review what's going on. And then of course, you know, I, 
I'd be remiss to not acknowledge that sometimes there are issues that we can't deal with over the phone. Uh, a classic one for me is I was talking to a fellow who was looking for a, a, a same day Suboxone start. And as I was going through the collateral that I had and listening to him, it became clear that, you know, there was more going on. He was a type one diabetic, had not been checking his blood sugars. His uh, withdrawal sounded way more extreme than I thought. So we acti activated EMS, had an ambulance uh, go to his place. He was in diabetic ketoacidosis and opioid withdrawal, and he was treated in acute care. And so we recognize that in, in a similar way, you know, you're talking to somebody and they're feeling suicidal. We're going to we're going to call the RCMP and have a wellness check for that person. Uh, we're going to, you know, activate EMS if there's something that's really uh, frightening or unusual uh, so that, you know, we're, we're providing good quality care. Um, it sounds like it. Okay. I'm going back to questions um, from Preeti. Thank you for an excellent presentation. How do you ensure some of the safety issues are dealt with while providing only virtual care, like ruling out pregnancy for traditional suboxone starts? Or, and this is an interesting one, ensuring that people are not already using methadone, either for the first methadone start or actually if someone wants to start buprenorphine, right? That that could not go well. Yeah, great, great questions. So, I mean, we we will we screen for pregnancy. We ask about, you know, last menstrual period. Is there a chance you could be pregnant? Typically, though, patients who are coming to us, if they're not in withdrawal already and we have any concern around pregnancy, well, then we can plan, right? So we can, uh, whether it's, you know, planning a methadone start and trying to avoid withdrawal for that person altogether, uh, or, and, and we do, we do methadone starts. That's, that's not a problem. It's, uh, you know, about, about 20% of the patients we see, 25% of the patients we see get methadone starts. So that's a usual everyday thing for us. But uh, it's very common that patients, when they're calling us, are already desperate and are already in withdrawal. So from a pregnancy point of view, um, to me, it doesn't really matter if I confirm that that person's pregnant or not. If they're already in serious withdrawal, that serious withdrawal is the thing that's causing the harm to the pregnancy. And so I'm keen to get them started on. And, we can, and we'll review what the pros and cons are of the different options and let that person decide how they want to proceed. But for me, anyway, I'm comfortable you know, doing a suboxone induction and particularly particularly, you know, with the aim of eliminating withdrawal within a, a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, um, you know, we've moved to in Ontario is advocating or at least supporting higher dose methadone starts for people who are using um, higher amounts of fentanyl. Um, and I'm wondering what your starting doses are like and whether the fact that you're you're seeing people by video for methadone starts is what you've said. Does that impact um, your decisions around starting doses at all? Yeah, so number one is I love video for methadone starts because you know a person can shockingly sound okay sometimes on the phone and then you get the video and you see their head bobbing towards the screen as they're telling you about how sick they're feeling and they just look uh, quite sedate. The other benefit that we have, of course, is that nobody's getting a single dose of methadone without actually being laid eyes on by our pharmacy partners. And so we 100% communicate with the pharmacy if we've got any concerns or, you know, to hold a dose if a person looks sedated or impaired or, you know, uh, is intoxicated with alcohol or other things like that. Um, we my my typical practice and it varies on our team uh, according to comfort level but if i've got somebody where i'm confident that they're using opioids maybe i have biologic evidence that they've used opioids fentanyl in the past that's on their healthcare records i have zero trouble with starting them uh, on 50 or 60 milligrams of methadone um, and uh, we usually will have uh, heart tracings and that available to us but then we try to stretch that out and get up to date information from them in the coming days. But by, you know, with 50 or 60 milligrams of methadone, most people are feeling a fair bit better. Yeah, we're not doing that. So that in itself is, is something to be thinking about. Um, pharmacists, a um, question about whether you've tried to sort of uh, do group education for pharmacists and pharmacies one-on-one, -on -one, what's been efficient and what's worked well for you? Yeah, we uh, when we first set up the program, we developed a pharmacy education package. And so we would actually have a one on one phone call from one of our uh, allied health team who was responsible for education. And she would call, you know, when we had a new patient at a new pharmacy that we'd never worked with before, she'd call the pharmacy. 
send them our, you know, fax them our package and then just walk through any questions that they had. And then there's a bit of a learning curve uh, in terms of, you know, what our expectations are and, and even for them and learning that they can actually rely on us. If they call us at, you know, 7.30 on Saturday afternoon, someone will actually pick up the call and deal with the problem that, they, that they're seeing. Um, but there is a lot of that work. We've had enough exposure in the province that, uh, you know, I think most pharmacies are aware of us and are aware of you know, how to work well with us. But we also do education. Actually, just earlier this week, I uh, presented an update on where VODP is at and, you know, some of the new things we're doing to our, our Alberta Association of Pharmacists. Um, question about providing care to um, patients living in First Nations communities. Yeah. Are there considerations there? How's that working? Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously we have to, so number one, in Alberta, a person who is uh, First Nations is seven times more likely to experience an adverse outcome because of opioids compared to the general population. So this is a population that uh, is uh, dear to our hearts and who we want to be able to help as, as keenly as possible. Uh, roughly 30% of all of our all of our clients at VODP are uh, identify as Indigenous. Um, we have had some nations where they've been very keen to, to be involved with the program and where they've welcomed us into their uh, health centers, where we're using their telehealth sites and we're collaborating with their nurse practitioners and their nurses and uh, have had very rewarding uh, outcomes for patients. We have an Indigenous liaison as well, one of our former patients who's stabilized and now works for the program to help uh, deal, with, uh, deal with some of the uh, challenges that we do face. Um, there are other nations, though, where they've been skeptical and reluctant to be involved in OAT work, and there's some stigma around OAT uh, provision. And we've tried to, to you know, in a in a respectful way, navigate those uh, those challenges when they arise, and be respectful of you know the the desires of the nation and the use of their own resources. But they're also respecting the fact that a person who's residing on a First Nation that's not particularly interested in providing OAT care also is still experiencing withdrawal and is still having a personal health care crisis that's not a, you know, sort of nation level health care crisis. And so we do provide care in First Nations communities. We would never turn somebody away regardless of what the sort of overall community situation is that might impact where they can go to get medication or where they can go for their telehealth follow-up or now that we have zoom that's usually not a major issue um, that being said we also have had some very very positive uh, uh, relationships so i i won't identify the nation uh, because that's for them to tell their story uh, when when the time comes but one of the nations in alberta came to us and said hey look you guys are providing some care to a few of our community members and we're seeing horrific outcomes um, we want uh, we want to be involved, and so instead of our um, uh, case management staff doing the case management for individuals in their community, they actually uh, wanted uh, our physician team to work with their staff on the ground in the local community, and for their staff to be the case managers for the community. And actually, uh, there's been by doing that. We saw a huge increase in uptake in the community. There was a community, a, a much broader community acceptance of the intervention. We also saw a massive surge in uh, willingness of, of people to try supplicate. Uh, and so now more than 50% of the patients in that community who are on OAT actually are receiving the, the once a month injectable. And uh, what, I've, what I've heard, and I have not seen the administrative data on this is that they've seen a massive reduction in overdose fatalities. Um, in fact, uh, I know uh, from speaking with the lead physician who works with their community that they were just really pleased that over the Christmas period this year, there were no overdoses in the community. And uh, actually there was a media request for that uh, community recently about how many uh, EMS responses they've had in the last three months. And um, it was down to less than five. So we couldn't actually really, AHS could not release any information because that would be too identifying. And so we've seen in some communities some 
really positive, wonderful things in collaboration. And we're so pleased by that. And we're looking forward to, to new partnerships and new opportunities as other na as the nations talk and share uh, their experience. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess as part of um, thinking about that, that kind of um, developing relationships and care, um, another question is about whether the program supports people using other types of substances. So alcohol, of course, um, being most obvious, stimulants, um, the focus is on opioids, but what if someone presents with a different type of substance use as a primary challenge and or as a secondary challenge? Yeah, so um, of course we take care of uh, people. So we're an opioid dependency treatment program. And so our, our primary um, responsibility is around opioids. However, of course, many of our patients, so during the pandemic, 50% of our patients were co-using methamphetamine uh, as an example, um, about 25% co-using alcohol. So we will deal with those other issues as they come up. Where, we, uh, where we're not providing service today is if we have somebody who were uh, to call in and they have a primary methamphetamine, no opioid problem or primary alcohol, uh, no opioid issue. Uh, and actually in Alberta, we're working on developing a, a sort of RAM model to be a sister program to VODP that uh, hopefully in the future, uh, we'll be able to just deal with all addiction issues in this distributed, readily accessible way. Um, I'm thinking about uh, the high prevalence of mental health challenges um, experienced by people who have substance use disorders and challenges. So how do people in this, how do the, the sort of staff um, and physicians um, in this model get a chance to address those things, connect people to other kinds of supports and connect people to primary healthcare supports for that matter? Yeah, for sure. Uh, those are great questions. So first off, uh, going to primary care, if we have somebody who calls in for care today and we were to start them on uh, buprenorphine uh, this evening, uh, one of the first things we do as that person stabilizes today and tomorrow and the next day is see whether or not they've got a primary care provider involved. And if they do, we are immediately sending a letter out to that person to say, hey, look, your patients accessed our service and this is what our intervention has been. Are you interested in taking over their OAT prescribing? Um, are you not interested? And whichever they prefer will facilitate. So we will bridge the person's care until they reconnect with their primary care provider and continue on that path. And we can provide support. We uh, provide uh, you know, the eight to eight um, yeah, telephone consultation service to primary care providers as well. But um, we, we will do that if they're not interested in taking over OAT, which many are not, um, then that's no problem. They're now aware that we're involved and uh, that we're providing that prescription and they've got a letter of who we are and what intervention we've done. And then we also upload all of our information to our provincial connect care system so that physicians and other clinics can actually see what we're doing. They can see what our care plans are and you know, sort of how the person's doing, all of our test results, all of that's available to other providers. In terms of mental health, uh, this is part of why we actually have uh, a larger component of registered psychiatric nurses over uh, regular RNs. Not that we don't like our RNs and we do have RNs in our teams, but you're right, there is a significant uh, degree of comorbidity with mental health concerns. And so we will work at addressing those issues as we can. And I should say that a person who's receiving longitudinal care through our program, you know, they're in a, a smaller center, we are seeing those patients regularly. We're not just over the phone. We're, you know, having video calls with them and checking in. And, you know, for me, having worked in a psychiatric hospital for most of my career until now, being able to see a person by Zoom in their home environment is actually so informative. Um, it's just really amazing. And, and so I think that we're able to bridge that. But we also recognize that we aren't supposed to be the answer to every problem. And so if we've got somebody who's got, you know, very significant psychiatric concerns and uh, they're not well connected with psychiatry, well, we have a robust telepsychiatry system in Alberta. It's time for us to get an appointment for them or with the local addiction and mental health clinic uh, or other supports uh, in place so that uh, uh, people are receiving appropriate care. So what percentage of um, people 
receive continuing care through the ODP as opposed to transitioning either to primary care or to another addiction center? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I haven't looked at that data recently. And the pro to be honest, the program's growing so rapidly, you know, over the last several years that it probably is changing over time. Um, we, we do a lot more work in Edmonton and Calgary now than we did three years ago, for example. And we're trying as much as possible where there are lots of care providers who are available. We're trying as much as possible to, uh, to discharge, to transition and discharge people to other care providers, just so that we have capacity to continue to do the, the important work we need to do. Um, my, my estimate is that probably two thirds of the patients that we see uh, for rapid initiation, we're aiming to transition out to other providers. Aiming to transition out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it sounds like there are really quite rural communities where that might be really difficult, but certainly in the sort of urban or closer to urban areas, there are enough options that that's feasible. And are those, because you've spoken about how everything is publicly funded. I mean, Ontario, everything is publicly funded in that, um, you know, care is provided through the Ministry of Health, but there are different groups of clinics or types of clinics. Um, and some provide, uh, I guess now post pandemic, most are providing um, virtual care, even if they didn't before. Some are set up to really provide primarily or almost exclusively virtual care. And I'm wondering if the, there's sort of a, a parallel in Alberta where there are two different kind of streams of virtual care. Um, and also if there are any frustrations or challenges about people moving back and forth between different um, streams of care. Yeah, I, I haven't really, I haven't seen in Alberta a major shift to be of clinics becoming exclusively virtual uh, for the the private um, ODP clinics, and there are there are private ODP clinics. There also is a network of publicly funded ODP clinics in Alberta. So you know, there's a large Edmonton ODP program with some satellites that's all publicly funded in Calgary ODP, uh, Lethbridge, Red Deer, Medicine Hat, uh, Cardston, Fort McMurray, Grand Prairie. So there's you know, it's in our sort of major centers. There's a publicly funded, fully public service. Um, health service uh, programs. Um, and and so I, I haven't seen that transition to pure virtual. Um, and I think part of that is that a lot of the programs in Alberta uh, really, you know, for the private programs really rely on people having to come into their associated pharmacy in order to uh, fund their operation. Um, and it, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. There, certainly are challenges with people bouncing around and so we do hear that sometimes so we'll have you know some clinics will come to us and say look this person has come to you guys six times for you know bridging care and they show up once and then they disappear and you know it's very frustrating and we don't like this and uh you know it's it's real and i get it that's uh, you know, nobody likes pay, likes it when patients are bouncing around and you don't know what's going on and uh, you're concerned about whether or not there's double doctoring and you have to be, you have to dot your I's and cross your T's there. The flip side though, is if we've got somebody who's particularly unstable and we're getting them on an evidence-based treatment that maybe we're witnessing at the pharmacy of their choice that's closer to where they live and they're bouncing back and forth, you know, that's a more of a system problem and less of a person problem in my opinion. And it's our job as addiction providers to figure out how to make the system work for people, as opposed to saying, nope, sorry, this is your, this is your fourth transition this year, so we're not going to help you. We're, our, our program philosophy is just that now nah, we're going to meet you where you're at. And, you know, if the other side's getting frustrated, we'll, we'll try and figure out how to bridge that frustration and make sure that the communication is more straightforward, that it's abundantly clear what we did and didn't do. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's about that person. Uh, I, I recall a, a case where one of the urban programs, uh, they were quite frustrated because they had a patient who uh, had disappeared to care and was on methadone and she's pregnant. And, uh, and then she'd popped up into our care. And, uh, you know, they were saying, what are you doing interfering? And it's like, listen, you know, a pregnant patient using fentanyl called us in withdrawal at seven o'clock last night. Of course, we interfered in your care. Of course mm -hmm. we did. 
And you may be trying to teach her a lesson by saying that she has to go to the pharmacy for in-person because of this or that, but I don't really care. That's a you problem. She's the one who's pregnant and she's the one who is in withdrawal. And we saw her. So we saw her, we saw the withdrawal, the pharmacist saw her, saw the withdrawal. And so we're fully comfortable. And if you're, you know, if you're on, if you're unhappy about that, that's a you problem. Yeah. Well, that sums up a lot. Um, there was something I was going to ask on that that went out of my mind for the moment. Um, oh, I know what it was. Can, can the quote unquote private clinics also see the um, Epic or Connecting Care? Like, do all providers have the same access to information? So all providers are able to act. So if you had no privileges, no Alberta Health Services privileges, you can't get into Connect Care. So Connect Care is an Alberta Health Services product. The flip side, though, is that we also have our longstanding predating NetCare uh, or Connect Care uh, program called NetCare. And NetCare has all of our consultations, all of our lab work, all of our EKGs, and all of our dispensing information. And so our, you know, when we do a consult, it goes to Connect Care and NetCare. So it's visible there. Our prescriptions are visible there. And then any lab work that we have. So they're able to see that. A lot of practitioners will have at least some level of privileging within Alberta Health Services, which then allows them to get the full package. Um, question about um, patients in custody, jail or holding cells. What has the response been? Um, is there a process to support virtual care for patients in jail or holding cells wanting to start methadone? Yeah, so we we do start uh, people on buprenorphine or methadone um, in in the uh, in in the police cells, so that in, in everyone thinks of jails and prisons and cells as different things. So, if a person's in police cells, we can start them on methadone or buprenorphine. Um, our preference is buprenorphine. Um, well, it's our preference for most things, but uh, for sure, if somebody's been on methadone in the past, or if they've had a you know they haven't done well with buprenorphine in the past or whatever, we'll for sure start them on, on methadone. And then the same thing in our correction system, we use both products. I actually find in the correction system, so where people are there for days to months, that uh, there's a strong preference for buprenorphine uh, over methadone. And, uh, you know, I, unfortunately, I think that, uh, you know, that might be a topic for a whole nother discussion, but uh, there is, a, you know, the trafficking of buprenorphine in that setting. And, you know, a person who's on methadone and then snorts a line of uh, crushed up suboxone is going to get really sick. So why be on the methadone? Uh, mm -hmm. So we do see a, a, some of that, but, um, you know, we, we are able to provide both products. Um, for buprenorphine, is ongoing care continued as phone calls or does that transition to video? And for anyone, do you flip back and forth between the two or do you try to focus on um, video and use phone just as backup? Yeah, so um, we try to have that that zero barrier telephone sort of access to get in to get the initial assessment and induction. And then once a person is in ongoing care, we actually do want to see them. So we want to see how they're doing. We want them to see us. We want that warmth that can happen over a video that isn't the same over a phone call. Um, but we do a blend. So if that if that it's not going to work to have a video call every time, we we may do telephone calls. Um, but uh, certainly with each person, we'll have their own case manager who's uh, you know perhaps a social worker or an addiction counselor, they're going to have video calls with that person, but also they're going to talk on the phone. They're also going to be texting with that person. Hey, how's it going? Uh, Check-ins and that kind of thing. And we, we are fairly pragmatic about what's going to work for an individual situation. But for me, for, um, you know, 99% of my follow-up visits with patients, those are all by video. I'm just blown away by the concept of a case manager for every person in the program. Um, and I wonder if you could just, I know we have to wrap up, but speak maybe to the impact of that relative to um, so many of the other steps that you've taken to reduce barriers, um, which obviously improves access to medication and working with the pharmacy. What's the, the contribution of the case manager to the, the success of individuals? Yeah, you know, I, I, I didn't know how impactful case managers would be when we first set it up. Part of why we set up the case manager system was actually to preserve uh, 
physician resource. So by having a case manager who's checking in with that person, you know, regularly and having phone calls and video calls and, you know, providing them with counseling and that sort of thing, it allowed me to do more intake assessments and to do more of those other things and then have less frequent follow up visits. What we found with case managers is that their relationship with the person and their awareness of how their their kids are doing and their awareness of where works at and their awareness of all of the details of that person's life. Along with the ability to text because i'm not going to be receiving you know hundreds of texts from hundreds of patients. Um, their ability to text and check in actually really increases the penetration of the program uh, to that person's everyday you know level of functioning and then it allows the physician to to take that step back and then have those uh, less frequent visits so when a person's first in the program we'll see them maybe we'll see them a couple of weeks later and then maybe we see them monthly for the first little while where in many face-to-face -face programs the physician's seeing them weekly but we're letting the case manager do that weekly visit and then we're checking in with the case manager so all of our case managers have an opportunity to re review all of their clients with their physician each week to just go through and get updates and deal with issues as they arise and uh, I think you know when we we, when we survey our, our patients and we do a lot of data collection, um, they love having a case manager. They love someone who that they, they can pick up this, the, the phone and get through right to that person because we give them the case manager's cell phone number. They can text that person and say, hey, you know, my grandma's sick and I'm going to be out of town for three days. And the case manager can get everything arranged for their prescription to be moved. It's not an ordeal. Um, clients love it. Last question. I'm glad you said survey because that was one of my questions. How are you evaluating? I'm sure there's provincial level data from the you know narcotics um, monitoring systems. Um, just like a minute's worth of how you're surveying or grabbing feedback otherwise. Yeah. So we do uh, we do a, an intake assessment. It's actually pretty comprehensive, uh, covering a lot of things like that BTOM measure that I showed drug use and all of those sorts of things. We repeat that again at three months, at six months, and at 12 months. Now for the follow-up assessments, those are all voluntary, so people don't have to do them. But um, the, you know, we try to get as many to participate and, you know, many people will do part of it and it's, it's quite long. So it's, it is a bit of a challenge that way, but that's how we get our system level stuff. We also do, um, so when COVID came, for example, and we got Zoom, uh, we actually did push surveys out to our patients, asking them for their feedback on Zoom, asking all of our providers for their feedback on Zoom. So we have the ability to do that and reach out and get, uh, get some data that way. But uh, we really care about those, that zero, three, six, and 12 month follow up so that we can uh, have a better sense of what's actually going, going on on the ground. And we published an article um, about that. And so there's you know, some data points that uh, the audience might be interested in. Absolutely. And I don't know if that was in your slides or not. I know you, you, you said you would share those slides, which I'm sure people will be looking forward to. Um, That'll be a great yeah. yeah, I'll share the slides and uh, maybe I'll add it on at the end. I, I don't think I added it in the slideshow, so uh, I can put that in. That would be great. Well, we have gone all the way to age 29 and um, I, I thank you so much for really letting us dive into the details. I know people want to get kind of, at least I wanted to get pretty granular um, to understand how it works. There are some huge takeaways around creating teams uh, having case management, um, high starting doses of methadone. I'm really interested in that as well. Um, and ways to um, reduce barriers. Um, and I really like thinking about the, um, the BTOM as a method to use. So lots and lots for us to think about. Lots of thanks in the, um, the chat. And I would just ask everyone to please remember to fill out the evaluation form because it's great uh, feedback for us as well. That's in the chat as well. Thank you so much and uh, on to hockey for those who are watching. Thanks so much. Thanks.